it, uh, our keynote speaker for this morning, Dr. Lani Gunawadena. Okay, she really requires no introduction. But, but she is a prof distinguished professor from University of New Mexico, uh, Albuquerque, in the Department of Distance Education and Instructional Technology. In the past 20 plus years, she has accumulated this amazing body of work. If you are in the field of distance education, social presence, interested in social presence theory, social construction of knowledge, or especially in particular the social cultural aspects of learning in the digital age, you must have come across her work. Um, she is really well respected nationally and internationally of all the work that she has accomplished. But you know, above all that accomplishment, what's most amazing about her is her personality. And I remember a few years ago, I actually met her for the first time in a sister conference at Media in Honolulu, Hawaii. And I came up to her, introduced myself, and then she said, I remember you. Oh wow, that, that was a surprise to me. Um, but uh, earlier, several years before that, I was a fresh graduate out of a PhD program and her institution had a job opening <laughs> and I applied. Of course, I didn't get a job. I'm very happy I'm here in Hawaii. <laughs> uh, but when I came up to her, she, the fact that she remembered me really humbled me. So I'm so thrilled to be able to meet her again in all places here in Hawaii. So it's my great pleasure to present you our keynote speaker of this morning, Dr. Kunawatana. Thank you. You're on the floor. Aloha, can you hear me okay at the back? Okay, thank you Grace, that was such a beautiful introduction. And I'm really humbled to be here and to share with you my years of experience researching online learning and culture, which have, are two of my great passions. So thank you AACE and Gary Marx and Sarah Benson for inviting me to come and talk to you here. So the topic I chose was culture and online learning and to talk about global perspectives on this topic. Now with e-learning going global, international, with uh, many MOOCs being uh, developed to engage global learners. This is a topic that I think has been in the minds of many folks. So, Let's think about your online course. Uh, I met some of you last night, and some of you are instructional developers, others are instructors, others are planning to teach online. So just look at the context of your online course, if you've developed one or taught one, or have been a learner in one of them. You have a group of students from diverse cultural backgrounds and different ages, you may not see them at all, how do you ask them to greet each other? How do you ask them to introduce themselves? I want you to keep this in mind because right from the beginning of this class, culture plays a role. And I'm going to get back to it a little later. So here's your online course. It represents a vast array of diversity. And sometimes you'll not meet them at all. So. Let's come back to this issue of how people present themselves online to each other. So understanding these learners and learning from a cultural perspective is really critical to have an online, a successful online learning experience. We need to be mindful of learning preferences. Each of us have our own ways of learning and preferred ways of learning. Uh, we have certain educational expectations, and we come from different kinds of social cultural contexts, so we bring with us prior knowledge, past experiences, and more. So how do you understand your learner? How do you understand and utilize the learning experiences and past experiences they bring with them? So the objectives of this, ob objectives of this session 
uh, to explore definitions of culture for the online learning context. Now, this has always been very challenging. Then examine influence of culture on online learning, the difference, different ways in which culture influences online learning, and then offer some guidelines on how to address culture in instructional design, learner support, and facilitation and mentoring. So let's start with how can we define culture? And I think many of you who have tried to do research on culture have battled with this question. The answer is, we lack a universally applicable theory for classifying cultural differences. And especially in technology-mediated learning, technology learning environments, it's really challenging to define culture. But this opens up a huge possibility for us to define culture in relation to, a, to our own context. And so we, let's look through some of the definitions that have been used in prior research on culture and online learning. So let's look at some cultural constructs for understanding diverse learners. Most of you are, I'm sure, familiar if you've studied culture with Hofstede's definition of cultural dimensions. He talked about power distance. Power distance is the degree to which power in society is differently distributed. He talked about individualism work versus collectivism. He classified some societies as being individualistic. That is really putting emphasis on individual goals and objective versus the collective goals of a community. Some were classified, some cultures and national cultures were classified as having more masculine traits than feminine traits. Uncertainty avoidance is always difficult to de de uh, define. This is the degree to which a society can tolerate ambiguity or not tolerate ambiguity. Then he added another orientation, a long-term orientation, which he added after his studies with Bond, uh, with Asian cultures, and this is how people are oriented either short term or long term. So this dimensional framework has been used in many studies that have looked at culture and online learning. So I myself, one of the first research studies I did way back in 2001, looking at group process and group <coughs> development between uh, Mexico and the USA, I used Hofstede's model. And Mexico is classified as a high power distance society and USA as a low power distance society. High power distance meaning that there are different levels in society as to who has power and who doesn't. Low power, USA, that the power structures are not as well defined. Okay, so we examine group process and group development. And what we found in our focus group discussions with these online participants, the Mexican participants came from the Monterey Tech Virtual University, and the US participants were from uh, New Mexico. What they said was the Mexican par participants said that the online medium is a liberating medium that equalizes status differences. So their interactions online would not necessarily reflect high power distance communication. So whereas there may be instances of high power distance in traditional society, when they come online, they expect that environment to be more equalizing. And they don't want social context cues in this environment that might make things uh, unequal. They said that they usually take the first person's posting and build on that post. And this was really interesting, and they said they are not really interested in who people are, but they are interested in what they say and how they contribute to the learning community. Now, a similar finding emerged in Moroccan and Sri Lankan anonymous chat when I studied uh, in, I, I was uh, a sabbatical, spent my sabbatical in Morocco and Sri Lanka, going to internet cafes and trying to determine how people actually enjoy the medium uh, of online communication, which was new at that time, for synchronous chatting. Now, they too felt that the person's position was not that important. 
how they contributed to the learning community was more important. So this made me wonder about how using frameworks that we have actually developed to understand traditional society in the online context. So some of the limitations are of these bipolar dimensions or what are called essentialist frameworks because it's either this or that, that is individualism versus collectivism, high power distance or low power distance, is the fact that you know these assumptions tend to think of members of a national culture as being homogeneous, that everybody subscribes to the same cultural concept. So when we make decisions or when we make judgments about culture, we tend to think that everybody in that national group tends to have the same cultural characteristics. And we know that there are many individual differences, that there are many subcultures. Also, we ne neglect the subculture within various countries and cultures. Cultures are not static, but they change over time. And one of the criticisms against Hofstede's uh, essentialist frameworks was the fact that the sample was based on a single multinational organization. So there are problems when we do bring these frameworks from, that were developed to understand national cultures to study online learning. Another cultural construct that I have used in my own research is Hall's 1959 conceptualization of high context and low context communication styles. So the difference here is that in high context cultures, many things are left unsaid, letting the context explain the message. This is sort of related to direct and indirect communication. So indirect communication is a feature of high context cultures where you don't communicate the exact message in the words you say. In low context cultures, you code your message in the words you use. Now this is an interesting conceptualization which has been also related to thought patterns by Ishii in 1982. He talked about how, Hoff's, uh, how Hall's high and low context dimensions and thought patterns have actually some similarity. He called it the American bridge model, which is analogous to linear thinking and low context communication, where ideas are communicated explicitly or directly from one point to another. So in a bridge, you go from one point to another. And he contrasted this with the Japanese stepping stone approach, where ideas are communicated indirectly as if arranging stepping stones, where the arrangement itself may not be very clear, and the reader has to infer the meaning, because not every word expressed communicates that meaning. Now this form, he said, he argued that this form of spatial logic can be quite foreign to those who want facts lined up in order. Now I myself, in my online classes, sometimes have had to tell international students, you know, you've got to right to the point. In the introduction, you need to actually express exactly what you're trying to do in this paper. So if you look at the research paper model that we often use for our papers in online classes, that's a very low context means of writing. So again, there are different thought patterns, there are different writing styles and rhetoric styles. Now the question that Goodfellow and Lamy asked about culture is, are cultural frameworks developed in the West useful for understanding culture in global e-learning? So I, uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Yoshi Mike, who was from the University of New Mexico from the communication department, but now he's a professor at uh, the University of Hilo in Hawaii, at, uh, the, in the Department of Communication, he talked about three areas that are important to consider from an Asian paradigm of communication. One is the concept of relationality, how communication takes place in context of various relationships. So even the greeting of bowing to each other requires you to really understand the relationship between you and the person that you bow to. So the bowing experience, you know, when you bow your head, that experience actually communicates meaning in the culture, especially the Japanese cultures that use it. 
Circularity, the communicator is both active and pas passive in multiple contexts. And the importance of harmony. Mutual adaptation is of central importance as adaptation is the key to harmonious communication relationships. So in communication, you tend your level best to be harmonious rather than aggressive, rather than opposing or presenting conflicting views. So he presented this from an Asian perspective, and I think there is some very interesting research going on now looking at how communication can be defined from a more Asian perspective. Then moving on to online learning context, we have the concept of learning cultures. How is culture negotiated and socially constructed online? So this is the stage at, at which we really need to put some emphasis and to understand how culture is nego negotiated and socially constructed online. So Goodfellow and Lamy in their book on learning cultures, where technology is a player in the social interaction through which online learning cultures are built, emphasizes that an interacting group creates its own learning culture. Jung talked about how students learn not only content, but culture unique to online learning when they come into an online class. Rafegli and Richery talked about the network learning should emphasize Bruner's idea about education as forum, where culture is not transmitted, but generated through interaction. And this all boils down to this famous saying that Edward T. Hall made in 1959, that culture is communication and communication is culture. So when we look at the online context, what we really need to pay our attention to and focus on is this concept of communication. It is in, through the process of communication that we actually convey culture. So for my work so far, I have used the concept of idioculture, which I have borrowed from Gary Fine, who actually talked about cultures of little league base, uh, basketball or baseball. And he said that an idio culture is a system of knowledge, beliefs, behaviors, and customs shared by members of an interacting group to which members can refer and that serve as the basis for further interaction. So the important concept here is the concept of the interacting group and that the interacting group actually creates its own culture. So this definition accommodates the idea of culture as emerging from a local activity system. This was Cole and Engstrom, who also used uh, Fine's definition. And it also accommodates the notion of culture as negotiated by online participants whose ethnic, gender, and religious identities are enacted or concealed or merged into hybrid identities online. So, in an online context, we bring our own cultural frameworks, our own sociocultural frameworks. They get merged in the interacting group, the interaction that happens through technologies, and we form these idio cultures. So let's look at online learning cultures. The first thing you have to think about is identity. So now I want you to go back to my first slide where, you sh where I showed you your diverse cultural group. In virtual environments, identity is more fluid and it can be changed to appeal to different audiences. Now in online classes where students actually enroll in institutions, it's a little bit difficult to hide identity. But if you have a totally anonymous group and people don't know you, then you have a real chance for identity play. So, when you ask your students to introduce themselves online, which is usually the first thing we instructors do, we ask them to post photographs, and some of our learning management systems require you to do that. That can lead to stereotyping and reduce anonymity. Some students are not comfortable posting their photos online for you know different reasons so one of the ways in which i have overcome this identity formation and creation online 
is to give students the option of posting an image that represents them and say why it represents them. This way you take the difficulty of posting your own image online. Now, those of us who have in, been interested in social presence, we, thought, we think that posting pictures is important for us to connect with each other. But this is difficult for many people. Now, I've noticed that even when I do web conferences in my class, some students really don't want to turn their webcam on because in the evenings they are in their comfortable zone, they don't want to really be seen. A little bit of anonymity is good. So usually it's me putting my webcam on and quickly taking it away, and I've noticed how hardly anybody turns it on unless you ask them to turn it on. So think about this concept of self-presentation and self-identity that is sometimes challenging for students. In fact, when I did a cross-cultural research project with uh, uh, students in Beijing University in China, uh, one of the things I did was understanding the fact that it would be difficult for them to really introduce themselves to the group, I matched one Chinese student with one, one of my own students at UNM, and they got to know each other, and each one introduced each other online so that students didn't have the difficulty of introducing themselves online. Creation of identity enables one to experience the world in a new way as well. And so, identity play sometimes is good. This lends itself well to role play and simulations. So when you create role play situations for your students to engage in online, students are able to create a different identity and actually engage using that different identity. Anonymity is important to facilitate honest dialogue or controver on controversial issues. So at one time, I had an issue, uh, I had a, a faculty member who was teaching health, uh, health education, and she had certain controversial issues that she wanted students to discuss. And so we gave them actually an anonymous, uh, anonymous I ID so that it would not be associated with their name and gave them a different forum. And it was quite amazing how very open students were the moment they knew that their identity would not be recognized. So the issue of identity is one of the major aspects of an online course, and it's important for us to consider identity, uh, identity expression. I think identity is really important for relationship building, but we also need to recognize that self-disclosure is not easy and devise ways in which people feel more comfortable communicating about themselves. So another concept in the online environment is the issue of social presence. So the question is, are there cultural differences in the perception of social presence? Do people react differently to social presence? So social presence is this concept of the feeling of the other person at the other end of the communication line. Usually interaction enhances social presence, but it's not the same thing. It's this feeling that the person at the other end of the communication line is actually connected to you in some way, or not connected. So I want to cite three studies. One is by Tu, uh, Chi Tu, in 2001. And he said that Chinese students perceived online communication as more comfortable because of lack of confrontation and face-saving concerns, and thus increased their social presence online. Then in a study that we did, the previous study I talked to you about group development and group process between Mexico and the US, US participants felt that social presence is necessary to the smooth functioning of the group. Now usually, when you ask students to introduce themselves, you will see that students in the US generally tend to talk a lot about themselves. They talk about their hobbies, their you know, spouses, their significant others, their children. But whereas people from perhaps Latin American countries and Asian countries hardly share personal information when they introduce themselves. Mexican participants felt that what matters most is how peers contribute to the discussion and not who they are. And actually, they didn't really want to know who their peers were in terms of their real life positions. 
whether they were directors of companies or etc. They didn't want to know positions. Then Al Hati, in her study of Arab students, said that for Arab students, lack of physical presence was positive as it reduced the risk of social embarrassments, especially for female Arab students. And so really, they liked the anonymity of the online medium because they felt more comfortable in this medium where gender differences are more marked in, that, in their societies. And also, they were afraid that what was said online by one of them might be taken and turned the other way in, uh, with people you know, with the other gender specifically who might know them in their traditional social context. Next, let's look at interaction. What have we learned about interaction? Now, some early studies have shown the importance of designing interactive learning activities to support learning online. I mean, right now, I think we are in a general form of agreement that interaction is important for online learning. For a long time, we had a big debate about this, whether interaction was necessary for online learning or not, but now we tend to conclude that interaction is important for a conducive online learning experience. Now, generally, some of these studies have shown the importance of designing interactive learning activities to support learning online and contradicts the general belief that Asian or South Asian, Asian learners would be less likely to interact online because they come from a traditional education system that encourages passivity and reception of ideas from a more, more learned teacher. So the general belief has been that Asian students are less likely to interact online because they have a lot of respect for the teacher and don't want to contradict the teacher and are more reluctant to post their ideas online. But I found this to be different in a study that I did in Sri Lanka, my own cultural context. Uh, I did a faculty development forum and I designed it in a hybrid format. Part of it was face-to-face, -face, part of it was online, to teach them how to interact online. Once they were trained how to interact online, they really appreciated the interaction and actually learned from it, didn't realize that online could facilitate interaction. And so interaction between instructors and learners and among learners was a very high predictor of learner satisfaction in this faculty development forum. They were also required to produce uh, documents at the end after they engaged in solving three social problems in Sri Lanka. The three social problems were common to practically every faculty member who was in that le a learning experience. One social problem was how to deal with uh, the street children who were becoming more and more prevalent after the tsunami in Sri Lanka and after the war. Uh, one social problem was how to clean up garbage in the city. And the other one was how to clean up, how to uh, manage traffic. So students engaged in these, discussing these social problems. Mostly, the whole purpose was to get them engaged in discussing and learning how to interact. And I had my students at UNM serve as electronic mentors, e-mentors, to these groups that figured out how to interact and solve a problem. Then Chen and Wang said that Chinese online learners ask for more interaction and flexible learning strategies and activities guided by instructors, whereas their institutions place more emphasis on the provision of video lectures. So the institutions feel that you have to have this expert teacher on video for the students, whereas the students themselves would prefer more interaction and interactive learning activities. Bray, Ioki, and Glukos, I hope I'm pronoun pronouncing it right, in 2008, in their study, also showed a similar uh, finding with Japanese students. Predictors of learner satisfaction in online learning in Japan showed similar results, although preference was for student-teacher interaction. 
Now, one of our main issues as online learning designers and instructors is the fact that we have to spend some time to engage our learners in interaction and to show them how to engage in interactive learning activities. If they don't know how to do interaction, of course, most probably they won't engage in it. So one of the things that we have to really help our students do is to get them oriented to learning interactively. And once they are familiar with that, most probably they will like to interact and learn from that interaction. So my next, next uh, concept that I want to discuss with you is the concept of knowledge construction. Now I have been trying to figure out how you really look, facilitate social construction of knowledge online. That is how students and teachers, experts all communicate with each other and generate new meaning through these interactions. Meaningful learning requires deep engagement with ideas. Deep engagement is supported by the critical thinking skill of argumentation. Learning to argue represents an important way of thinking that facilitates conceptual change and is essential for problem solving. Now this was David Jonathan and Kim. Now my question here is, are such challenges to ideas expressed by others and discussion of disagreement a necessary condition for higher forms of reasoning or knowledge construction? Or is it merely an expectation from a Western point of view? Now, the more and more I engaged in online teaching and interacting with my students, this concept really uh, made me want to understand this position more. So in the Western world, we think that debate, we think that opposition to ideas is really important for social construction of knowledge or new construction of knowledge. But this may not be so in other cultures. So how I found out was uh, we had developed the interaction analysis model for assessing social construction of knowledge. Some of you may have used it in your research. And essentially, this is a model for assessing learning in online context. We look at different phases that learners go through as they engage in dialogue and interaction. Usually in an online conference, you have people sharing and comparing information the moment you ask them a question or a top, give them a topic or a problem to solve or case study to analyze. Then you usually have certain disagreements or dissonance, what we call cognitive dissonance, coming into being, you know, opposing ideas. Then people tend to negotiate and come to agreements and propose new constructions, test them, and then actually apply them. So this model has been used by many researchers to assess online learning and research uh, online learning analyzing computer transcripts. What was interesting was that a study done in Mexico by Lopez Islas using this model to analyze online dialogue said that open disagreement with ideas expressed by others is not appropriate in the Mexican context. Participants move to knowledge construction without exhibiting cognitive dissonance as described in the interaction analysis model. So cognitive dissonance is this phase. And actually this model was developed based on a debate that we had conduct, conducted across international timelines. And so of, obviously in a debate, you have agreement statements, disagreement statements. And in this particular debate, in spite of the debate leaders keeping the groups apart, they negotiated and came up with new meaning. So, in Mexico, they didn't see that level of dissonance. I found the same thing with Sri Lankan participants. They did not openly disagree at the level of ideas, but moved to negotiation of meaning and co-construction of new knowledge based on consensus building. So they didn't openly disagree or argue, but they built consensus. So knowledge construction did happen, but we didn't see that expected phase of dissonance. Then Chen in 2000, he analyzed the global email debate and said that the debate format caused orientation problems for Asian learners as it, as it is a product of low context culture. 
that requires direct expression of one's argument by using logical reasoning, and that this was difficult for Asian students. So our general perception and belief in Western cultures and predominantly American cultures that argument, conflicting ideas, opposing points of view are necessary for constructing knowledge may not be the same in all cultures. So I have been very interested in doing further research on this concept of dissonance and how it is, how it is handled and uh, worked in different countries. In Sri Lanka, when I ask people, why is it difficult to say something opposing to a person's argument online in an academic setting, they said it's because that argument might be perceived personally as a personal attack. So this was one of the things that we have to really encourage our students to learn that ideas expressed online should not be taken personally, that they are expressed to really understand a problem or an issue. Now, it was also interesting that in the same dialogue that was happening online in Sri Lanka, I had a social activity, a social cyber cafe, where students should go, could go and you know, enjoy themselves and discuss what is of relevance to them. The instructor was not pe present. So in this social forum, there was a lot of argument, a lot of dissonance happening. But in the academic discussion, no dissonance. So this is interesting because it's also telling us that the context and meaning attached to different spaces online enables people to either argue with each other or uh, not argue with, it, with each other or disagree with each other. So it's a very interesting area for further study. So let me try to offer some guidelines to address culture and to tell you about how I have done it in my online courses. One is to be creative in our online learning designs, to provide learner support, and to facilitate and mentor our students. So this is a little bit different from the traditional MOOCs now, uh, where our students generally are you know, given a lot of information, they learn on their own. I personally feel that for an engaging learning experience, you have to engage the learner in interaction to support them and mentor them. Okay, how do we account for culture in instructional design? Now one argument is that designing for global audiences requires not cultural neutrality, but cultural inclusivity. And this is the argument that really I support because very often I come across instructional designers who say, so why does culture matter? Do we really have to address culture in our instructional design? Because we can assume that our courses are made up of different cultures. And the concept of cultural neutrality, that culture does not matter, is also a problem. So cultural inclusivity is understanding the fact that we do have different cultures in our online classes, and then trying to accommodate this notion of cultural inclusivity, making everybody feel that they can be part of your online class. So cultural inclusiveness demands an embrace of the designers, instructors, and learners' cultural influencers and our anticipation of how these values and beliefs might impact learning. So it's not only the learners, it's also us as teachers, it's also ours as designers. And also an acknowledgement of the dimensions of culture specific to learning, such as past educational experiences that they bring with them, learning preferences, and language abilities. So I think if you look at cultural inclusivity as a conceptualization, that you go with when you design, most probably you may be able to design learning environments that might actually speak to different di di diverse learners in your classes. I want to tell you a story because stories sometimes emphasize uh, points. I had a student, a very young student in my class. I was teaching, I think, um, e-learning course design. And he kept on telling me, why do we need to pay attention to culture? And right from the beginning it was, why pay attention to culture? Isn't it taking a lot of time? And I said, you know, you have to experience it yourself. 
So I grouped him with a student from Burkina Faso. And at the end of the course, he came and told me, you were right. I realized through my interactions with Nesta that I need to pay attention to culture. Subsequently, he got a job as a designer for our supercomputing lab. And because they had the high-end technologies, I used to take my students to go and have you know, an experience with supercomputers, how, they use, how scientists use supercomputers, et cetera. And he used to always do this little introduction to my groups that I would take there. And one of the first things he stressed was the importance of culture in designing for scientists. So I felt that sometimes if you don't give your students the opportunity to really experience what it is to design, taking culture into account, they most probably will not realize why it matters. There is another argument that as, as instructional designers that we have to deal with now, and that is do we design for globalization where courses are culture neutral, or do we design for homogenization, where you embed your course with the cultural context it's being delivered from? That's another big argument. So these arguments are interesting for us to continue as we begin to do our research and continue with our design. So how have I done this? We developed a model called the Wisdom Communities Design Model in one of my advanced instructional design classes. And we have now tested it with uh, my classes uh, at the University of New Mexico, which are offered online, as well as in Venezuela and Sri Lanka. And I think there is something in this model that really makes it work. Okay, first of all, I want to focus on this graphic. I hope you see it well. And it describes the design model. The premise here is that the most important, this at the core of any learning experience, what is important is mentoring and learner support. And individuals will differ in their need for support. And then the community becomes a, cre a key aspect of how that learning happens within that commu learning community. So community, mentoring, and learner support are core to this instructional design model. We feel that any learning experience should have this. And then the group engage in, engages in knowledge innovation and knowledge construction. They start with a problem or case or a question. They explore it further. They usually, in my classes, I have them do this in groups rather than individually. So they explore, they make a list of learning issues, what they know now, what they don't know. Then they collect resources, they ask as experts. Right now my students are developing grant proposal for women's groups in developing countries. So they are working with women's groups and asking questions. And they reflect on them and then negotiate and preserve that learning. So they go through these cycles of inquiry and the end goal is for them to become wise because at the beginning of class, they define what wisdom is for the class and actually transform perspectives as a result of group interaction. So how we did this was to use a metaphor from Keresian Pueblo communities in New Mexico. So I'm from New Mexico. I'm embedded with many Native American communities. We have Native Americans in our class classes. And in a research study that was done by Romero, she talked about how she tried to define intelligence from the perspective of native communities. This was because she was teaching special ed, and many native students are classified as needing special education classes. And she felt that this is because they did not really understand the cultural context that these students came from. So she really wanted to define what intelligence was, how intelligence was defined in these Keresian Pueblo communities. And she found that how they defined intelligence was that intelligence was really a person's contribution to the community. 
So you might be very intelligent. You might be intelligent in the sense of having you know, done well in school, have great grades, et cetera. But if you haven't really contributed to the community, then you are not considered a wise person. So wisdom was actually the contributions you made to your community. So we got this concept or the metaphor from these communities and embedded that as an important aspect of our learning experiences. So for ill-structured learning domains, we have found this model to really work well. And so the premise is that you contribute to the learning community. It assumes multiple perspectives and diverse ideas are essential to understanding. And also, the model is fairly flexible to accommodate diverse learner needs, promotes self-determined learning cohorts. You know, they define their own identity, communication styles. You know, in my classes for every module, I'll have about three four, five groups, and each one defines how they communicate with each other, the technologies they use, and what their group charter is. And it encourages the development of multiple promising solutions. So you might be giving them the same problem to solve, but each group might solve it differently. They go at it in a different way. An individual and group are both valued in assessment. So that unless there is an assessment schema, that actually encourages collaboration and group work, they're not going to engage in it. And in this particular model, we actually encourage both. Learner support. Here are two different types of learner support systems. I designed one for Sri Lanka when I was doing the faculty development program, where they would have, in Sri Lanka, several multimedia centers across the country where students would come to. So the support system really had to take into account the cultural context, the social cultural context, and define a support system that was supportive of the different needs of those learners. The second one is one I have designed for my classes in New Mexico. So each one is similar, but there are certain areas where they differ. For example, because I engage, in peer learn engage students in peer learning, I really had to provide different kinds of support for peer learning. In the Sri Lankan context, for example, advisors and counselors were also part of the learning context and therefore had to be given some, uh, given uh, voice and given, uh, given uh, prominence. Learner support in terms of gender. Latcham talks about females and males having distinct learning needs, and there is need to ensure gender equality and flexibility in our online learning designs. However, research on gender issues in online education is really inconclusive as to whether there are differences. But those of us may have, who have taught online may have experienced issues with help-seeking behaviors, need for support, communication styles, preferred learning methods, and degree of anonymity that they would prefer. So gender, I haven't really focused very much on gender, but it is a subculture that we have to be concerned about. So in terms of facilitating and mentoring, we think about three areas that are really important to focus on. The facilitator and the mentor helps to build a learning community. You create the social environment and build trust among people in your class. You facilitate interaction and care about student responses. If the students know you really care about them, they are more likely to feel free to interact. You also, as a facilitator, have to support knowledge construction. You help groups to achieve their goals. You facilitate conversations, weaving of ideas, synthesizing and summarizing points. Also, preserve knowledge. One major issue in online discussions is managing information overload. How do you help students to manage information overload? We have a concept called knowledge artifacts, where students actually synthesize and manage information by creating artifacts that are uh, derived from the discussion. You assess and provide support and feedback. And mentoring can be thought of in many ways. Each group member is really a potential member, so you can 
uh, link novices with uh, people who are more experienced and experts either in technology or in the content. And also in online classes, you can invite community guests to serve as mentors and really bring in the community perspective into your online classes. So in a cross-cultural e-mentoring study that was done in Sri Lanka, we are with US e-mentors and Sri Lankan faculty as protégés, we identified six roles. One is inspirational, really encouraging students, you know, helping them achieve their goals. Technical, providing technical support. Support for collaboration with the group. Managing issues and supporting the content or the pedagogical creation of knowledge. And also providing social support. This is an area that we are working on further and uh, looking at how we can actually develop e-mentors, mentoring across cultures when you really don't know the people. All right, I want to sort of conclude with uh, an issue of interface design, because most of us designers have to think about interface. How would you interpret this icon? What is the meaning that you would give to it? Agreement, okay. Friendship, collaboration. A warning, okay, good. All right. How would you interpret this one? Would the interpretation remain the same or change? It changes, or the same? Changes, how does it change? More friendly, why? It's round, a circle, right? Okay, good. All right. Here is how people from Morocco interpreted it. It was interesting that some of you began with friendship, community. In Morocco, when we did this study of uh, looking at how people interpret icons and images from North American websites, we found that their interpretations were a little bit different. From their experience, you know, this is a danger sign. So therefore, they said it was a dangerous relationship. Whereas that triangle, so the figure ground relationship was an important one as well. So color is another factor. You know, when the colors you use online also impact different audiences. So this is an interesting, in Sri Lanka you have the elephant in in one of those things because the elephants cross. But th that's an important uh, thing to keep in mind. So I want to conclude with a cultural approach to research. Systemic and, so our definition, In Sung Yung and I recently wrote a book on culture and online learning, and our definition of a cultural approach to research is systematic and systemic study of the ways in which cultural forces interact with online environments and online learner behaviors. How does an online environment change the culture of an interacting group? What are the characteristics of new learning cultures that emerge online? How are learners transformed by interactions with culturally diverse learners? And how does the process of online knowledge construction differ across cultures? So these are some of the, one, some of the questions that are of interest to us. We list several others in the book. So here's the book, a plug for our book, Culture and Online Learning, Global Perspectives and Research. And we actually address all those issues there. It's a collection of authors. It's an edited book. It's a collection of authors from around the country. I also have references here of all the citations. So you can go ahead and read further. I would love to have your comments. And remember that there is a session after this uh, keynote where we actually come and discuss and thank you. <laughs>